when we're identifying par parameterization, sometimes we'll see that the x and y values are uh, determined using functions that are related by some identity. And this can sometimes help us to identify the parameterization. Some of the identities that are really common are uh, the Pythagorean identity, that uh, sine squared t plus cosine squared t equals 1. Um, also, its twin, or its triplet, I guess, tangent squared plus 1 equals secant squared. You just get that one divi by um, dividing both sides by cosine squared. Um, there's one for the hyperbolics, which is that the cosine squared of t minus the shine squared of t is equal to 1. You can derive this one if you start from e to the t plus e to the minus t over 2. Remember, that's the definition of what cosine is. And the definition of shine is similar. It's e to the t minus e to the minus t all over 2. So if you were to figure out cosine squared here, you'd have to use the FOIL method to multiply that out and use the FOIL method to find shine squared. You'd find that they were, they're related by this identity. Um, also, sometimes you see um, identities that come from like double angle things. So some of the problems might have a cosine 2t. Remember, cosine 2t is, cosine, is the same thing as cosine squared t minus sine squared t, which is also the same thing as 2 cosine squared t minus 1, which is also the same thing as 1 minus 2 sine squared t. So these are identities that, uh, that might come up in doing this. Let's look at an example of how an identity might be helpful. Okay, we have here um, a parameterization. X is a function of the parameter t and y is a function of the parameter t. And we need to figure out what curve are we talking about and what part of the curve do we see and in what direction do we move along that curve. Well, when I see that x is some direct function of sine and y is a direct function of cosine, I think to myself about that identity that sine squared t plus cosine squared t equals 1. In this case, if I solve for sine t, that's x minus 1. So sine squared would be x minus 1 squared. Cosine t is y plus 2. So cosine squared would be y plus 2 squared. And that equals 1. And we immediately recognize that as a circle, right? This is a circle that is centered at 1, negative 2 and it has radius 1. So we're talking about this circle here. So the fact that x and y, because x and y have, have these relationships to t, and because of this identity, we know that x and y always lie somewhere on the circle. The question is, do we see the entire circle or just part of it? And as time moves forward, what direction will we move along that curve? So, well, let's start by looking at what happens at our starting time. If t is 0, the sine is 0, so the x value is 1. And the cosine of 0 is um, 1. So we have 1 minus 2, that's negative 1. So we know that we're starting at the point 1, negative 1 on this curve. Now as t increases, the sine increases, so our x value should increase. At the same time, the cosine decreases as t increases from 0. So our y value should be going down. So in order for x to be increasing and y to be going down, we must be moving in this direction. Now we, we could ask, how far do we get? Well, by the time t is pi, the sine of pi is 0. So the x value is 1. one. The cosine of pi is negative 1. Negative 1 minus 2 would be negative 3. So the, the y value is negative 3. So we're going along this portion of the curve sort of the right semicircle part of the curve, and we're going in this um, clockwise direction. So now we have the Cartesian equation. There's the relationship between x and y, which we identify as a circle. We've got the graph, right? The graph of the Cartesian equation is the full circle, but for our particular bounds on t, we just start here and move around um, the right-hand half of the circle. Let's look at another one. Ah, so we have x is 2 times the hyperbolic sine of t and y is 3 times the hyperbolic cosine of t. So when I see the sine 
the shine and cosine, those hyperbolic functions, I remember that identity, cosine squared t minus shine squared t is equal to 1. So thinking of that identity now, cosine is y over 3, right? If I solve this by dividing both sides by 3, I get that the cosine is y over 3. So the cosine squared would be y squared over 9. And the shine, the shine is x over 2. So the shine squared would be x squared over 4 equals 1. And now since we've studied conic sections, we recognize that as a hyperbola. In fact, we could sketch that hyperbola pretty quickly. Since the number under, underneath y squared is 9, we go from the center up or down 3. Since the number under x squared is 4, we go right and left 2. And we can sketch in this little box as a guide. And the purpose of the box is if we extend the diagonals of that box, we find the asymptotes for our particular hyperbola. So extending those asymptotes. Now, let's see. If x is 0, y is plus or minus 3. So we have vertices here and here. And the actual hyperbola moves out and approaches the asymptotes. So starting at the vertices, you can move out, approaching the asymptotes. Now our question is, well, what's going to happen? What part of the hyperbola are we on? And um, in which direction are we moving? So if we look at this, um, y is equal to the cosine. One thing about the cosine is that it's always positive because the cosine is e to the t, that's a positive number, plus e to the negative t, which is also a positive number, all over 2. So the cosine actually looks like this. As time goes forward, it comes down. When time is 0, then you have 1 plus 1 over 2. That's 2 over 2, that's 1. And then as you go forward, then you have kind of exponential growth this way. So if you look at y as a function of t, the y value is always positive. The y value is coming down, and then it's going out again. Since the y value is always positive, we know we're on this upper branch. Now, x is, is, uh, is 2 times the shine. If you think about the shine, the graph of the shine alone, so if you look at how x changes just with t, um, the shine is e to the t minus e to the minus t all over 2. So as time goes forward, this term disappears. You have basically e to the t over 2. So you're just growing exponentially. Oops. Let's see, at time 0, you actually have 0 in the shine. It's growing exponentially. Because at time 0, you have e to the 0 minus e to the minus 0. But that's just 1 minus 1 is 0. Okay, as you go backwards, then this term fades away. And you have negative e to the negative t over 2. So that, that sort of grows like an exponential upside down. So this is the graph of the shine. So as time goes forward, can you see that the x value is always increasing, whereas as time goes forward, the y value initially decreases and then turns around and starts increasing. So that would be perfect for the upper part of the hyperbola, right? We know y can never be negative, so we know we can't be down here. So we're just going to m come in right, and bounce off and approach the other asymptote. So we have the upper branch of the hyperbola, and we're moving from left to right across that upper branch just based on considering what's happening to the x, which is increasing from negative infinity to infinity, and y, which is coming down from positive infinity, going down to 1, and then turning around again.